Welcome to parallel session number 15 of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. I'm very happy to see you here in Pyeongchang and I also send my greetings to everybody who is connected to us uh, online. Uh, we want to talk today about the possibility of eco-peace tourism in the South and North Gangwon province through bird watching and we have a very happy to have a very good panel here on that. Uh, I want first to tell you that we have for this session English Korean um, translation. So uh, here or outside uh, online, you can choose uh, the appropriate channel which you want to use. Uh, we have uh, four distinguished uh, speakers, and then we'll have some time for discussion. Please uh, leave us your comments or leave us your questions. Uh, I see here we have channel 7 is Hanguk o Korean, channel 8 is English. Now, the possibility of eco-peace tourism. When I reread this title for the session we put together here, I was a little bit worried that, well, you might think that's a very tall order. Ecology, peace, tourism in North and South Gangwon, in the current situation, and all of that through bird watching, is that really possible? Please don't misunderstand that as something like a solution for the whole situation, but see it as a small stepping stone towards better relation, which we want to discuss here. Uh, because uh, we cannot expect any project which potentially links North and South Korea in the end to come up with the solution. Even a big railway project would not be the solution to the north-south problem and also not to the transport problem. And the similarly, our uh, discussion we have here today, we cannot expect to get from uh, ecotourism or birdwatching tourism the solution for all problems on the Korean Peninsula. But it could be a small stepping stone. And I think uh, the past showed us that it is so important to explore various ways, also ways which are politically less loaded than maybe a railway or other projects, uh, to come to better relations or maybe even uh, peace. So what we want to discuss here is to look how ecotourism and uh, particularly a focus on migratory bird might aid to a better understanding of North and South to raise awareness on inter-Korean environmental cooperation as one aspect of peace policy, and also to do so, first of all, to provide some data for creating uh, an eco-space, ecological space around the Kangwon province and building an ecological community on the Korean Peninsula. To discuss these um, issues, we have uh, four distinguished speakers, and I start now on my right. We have uh, Mr. Doug Watkins, who is uh, the chief executive of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, which is a partnership of now 38 partners, um, government partners, uh, NGO partners, international organizations, and also company partners. And uh, Doug Watkins is very, very well known through all of the flyway which reaches from Alaska to New Zealand and to um, the borders of Southeast Asia because he worked in the last 40 years very, very passionately on bringing people together and working together to deliver solutions for the environment with the people, with local people and also international experts. Then on uh, the second, uh, just directly right be Beside me, we have uh, Dr. Han Nong Guk, who is a wetland and conservation ecologist and is currently director of the PGA Eco and Biodiversity Institute Korea and uh, executive director of Eco Korea, who does a lot of very, very important work in the border area and previously had been at the NIE, the National Institute of Ecology in Korea. Uh, he gained his PhD in, in Seoul, in Seoul University. On my left, we have, first of all, my dear colleague, Dr. Che Hyun Ah, who is working in our office in Hans Seidel Foundation, a forester by um, profession, but now a bird watcher by 
passion also and uh, looking into possibilities of very concrete north-south cooperation and who has been in North Kangwon province in uh, November 2019 last and seen also there what possibilities there are. And finally, uh, last but not least, on the very left, we have um, Mr. Uh, Pak Chong Sok, uh, who is the CEO of the Tsolabukto Ecotourism Sustainability Center now, but has also a very, very long history on promoting ecotourism on the Korean Peninsula, among others with Gyeonggi province and with the UNESCO Bi uh, Biosphere Reserve Ge uh, Geopark as a consultant, so also uh, close to the border areas, also a specialist there. I'm looking very much forward to your presentation now. We will allocate 15 minutes to each of you. Tr please try to be in time. And then we'll have roughly half an hour, a little less, for general discussion. And I'm looking very much forward now to you. Without further ado, Doug, please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Seliger. No, this doesn't seem to be working. Okay, as, uh, as the brief introduction, the, the Flyway Partnership uh, is about the migratory water birds uh, and the wetlands that they use across the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And this Flyway runs from uh, Alaska and the Russian Far East, uh, as far south as uh, the southern coasts of Australia and New Zealand. And international cooperation is clearly a key uh, component of successfully conserving this, uh, this migration route. Um, and there's a need to plan and coordinate actions in order to do this. Now, waterbirds, this is waterbirds' view of the world, but our view of the world is a national view of the world. Um, and with the national view of the world, each country has its own laws and its own regulations and, the own, and its own culture. And so the partnership uh, needs to be able to work across all of these different countries in order to deliver for the migratory water birds of the flyway. So the, the Flyway uh, Partnership has been formed. This is a voluntary, uh, a voluntary initiative. Um, it is, its core is developing a network of sites for the conservation of migratory birds across the Flyway. Um, it, uh, the second objective is enhancing the communication, education and public awareness uh, about wetlands and migratory birds. Uh, the third is about the science, which we use to uh, inform uh, decision-making. Um, the fourth is about building the capacity, uh, particularly uh, to manage these sites and to maintain these sites and the capacity of decision-makers and local stakeholders to, to understand how they fit into this big story. And lastly, we, we also have some special activities uh, focused on priority species, uh, and generally these are the endangered species. So our partnership has uh, 18, has 39 partners now. Um, 18 of these are national government partners, which are the, are the core uh, of our partnership because these are the decision makers for each of those, those countries. Um, a large number, 13 uh, international NGOs. These provide a lot of the enthusiasm uh, and the innovation into the partnership. Uh, six uh, international uh, conventions, such as um, um, the CBD and, uh, and Ramsar Convention, um, IUCN, an international organization, and one corporate. So, so this is the group of organizations that, that make up the Flyway Partnership. Uh, I wanted to use one example here that in English we say a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I think there might be a Korean saying that a chair is only as strong as its weakest leg. Um, so here, this is about the migration of the bar-tailed godwit. Um, and, and the bar-tailed godwit um, is a bird that, that breeds in, in Alaska and in Russia. 
and migrates as far south as, as Australia and New Zealand. And this was some work done a number of years ago, satellite tracking birds as they migrated north uh, from New Zealand and from Australia. And these birds, you can see, all have to stop in the Yellow Sea area to feed up again before being able to move on to their breeding areas. So this area here clearly is very important for the conservation of these species. And um, at our network site in New Zealand, um, the people there, which is a community organisation, really wanted to, to learn more about and contribute to the conservation of these birds in the Yellow Sea. Um, initially, their program of work was in China on the border um, at Dandong, uh, and then they, they moved to a program of activities in, uh, in DPRK. To do that, they linked with the Nature Conservation Union of Korea. Um, this is an organisation supervised by the State Academy of Sciences, um, and it's a, a, a representative, NGO representative for IUCN. And this organisation provided them with the ability to get onto the ground and over, over, over 10 years to survey much of the, uh, the west coast of, of DPRK. So these are community people who are volunteering and funding themselves to, to travel to DPRK and to do these surveys in collaboration with, uh, with uh, NUCK. Sorry, wrong way. The, uh, the, these uh, sh sites shown on the, on the diagram are the, where the network, uh, the network sites at the moment, um, covering uh, all of these countries. And uh, what's, what, we, what all of the countries have is this shared responsibility to manage and conserve these sites for the migratory waterbirds. And uh, around these sites, it's important to connect the local communities uh, to what's happening. So on the Korean Peninsula, um, there are 17 uh, flyway network sites at the moment. And these are sites that are internationally important for the migratory birds and have been nominated by the national government to be part of this network. Uh, most of these, 15, are, are in the south. And currently, there are two sites in the north. Uh, one on the west coast and one here near the east coast. And the one on the east coast is, is just on the, on the border of Gangwon province. Oops, wrong way. Um, this is the site, Kumia. Um, it's about uh, 5,500 hectares. Um, it's just uh, uh, north of this, of this embayment. Um, it has coastal wetlands, rice fields, salt works, uh, and, uh, and adjacent reservoirs. So it is quite similar uh, in, in the types of habitats to much of the, of the coastal areas in, in the south of, of Korea. This site supports over 40,000 birds annually, so it, it really does have spectacular numbers of birds coming through on migration, um, ducks and geese um, and cranes. Uh, these are some photographs of the area. Thank you, Dr. Seliger. Um, the uh, site became a, a protected area uh, under DPRK laws in 1995 um, and joined the, the predecessors of the partnership, um, particularly because of its importance for as a crane, uh, roost, crane staging site on migration. So talking a little bit about ecotourism um, and, and what's needed to, to develop a program of ecotourism. Um, uh, and here I'm sort of talking in reference to, to both parts of Gyeongwon. So firstly, this need to identify and review national regulations on ecotourism. You know, what is the context? What is the legal context? Particularly in DPRK, as we can expect that uh, there is not a lot of direct regulation of ecotourism, but there will be much other regulation which will overlap. There's a need to work out who the target tourist audience is. You know, who, do, who are you trying to attract uh, to, to, to your area? Um, and how do you access this audience? And thirdly, uh, you need to look at what the capacity is uh, in, in each area. Um, what is the capacity to promote ecotourism? How, what is the capacity of the site managers of these important areas that 
either are natural spectacles or, or have concentrations of migratory birds, for example? What about tour guides and interpreters? So there's quite a lot of human infrastructure around um, ecotourism activities. There's a need to identify potential loca locations for, the, for a tour program. And there's a need to look at the suitability of these potential target locations. Um, are they natural features? Uh, what are the opportunities to engage local communities? And particularly, how can you ensure that your ecotourism will bring benefits to that local community? So there's some risk assessment that you need to do um, to obtain and maintain that local community support. Um, you need to identify potential social and environmental impacts and how these could be managed uh, within the ecotourism operation. And then you need to plan the routes. How do you link up these locations that have been identified into an attractive program for ecotourism? If you're trying to do ecotourism around birds, then you even need to do more work. You need to understand uh, the seasonal occurrence of the birds, um, the habitats that the birds are using, and how you ensure that you avoid, uh, uh, avoid disturbance of the birds, um, and how you get the easy access to these sites, um, and also what the other implications are for the support facilities that you, you need around running an uh, ecotourism operation. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the potential linking of flyway network sites on the Korean Peninsula. So we've already had some local governments you know, coming to us saying we're really interested in developing links with the network sites uh, in the northern part of the peninsula. Um, and particularly the interest is in those birds that stop at these sites, that use these sites before coming on down to, uh, to the south. Um, and the uh, EAFP Secretariat and the Hans Seidel Foundation are working to explore this possibility. Um, the next steps, uh, we will continue our work um, of collaboration with, uh, with the DPRK Ministry of Land and Environmental Protection. But this is the key agency for the partnership. They are our, our partner and, and that we work with on, on building capacity with them um, in DPRK. Um, and We've also, um, uh, the Secretariat and, and, and Hans Seliger Foundation have talked about how we can, we, we can try and move things forward on this capacity building. And, and one post-COVID uh, option is to do some workshops in, in third party countries so that we can bring more stakeholders together. Currently, COVID is the major barrier because it's restricting access to, to DPRK and, and across the flyway. Um, more broadly, we will continue our work with our partners um, to enhance conservation activities for migratory waterbirds and their habitats across the flyway. And currently, um, we're working on developing um, uh, more detailed guidelines about uh, facilitating links between sites and also engaging the local communities um, in these activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Watkins. And I think that was a very fascinating uh, introduction to our topic uh, today and also thank you for being perfectly into time and so uh, I will first give now the um, word to Mr. Tudor Tahan, please. Good afternoon. I am from Echo Korea PGA Research Institute. I am Han Dong Uk. I am going to talk about uh, uh, the scientific methodology of ecological cooperation. We are talking about the East Sea now, but we also have to include the West Sea. We have to take into consideration the joint maritime areas of both East and West Seas, and we have to think about the principles of ecological tourism. 
If we look at the East Sea and the West Sea, there is the NLL, the northern uh, limit. And this is a hypothetical line that demarcates the northern and the southern seas. And it, it is include, if it includes the Han River estuaries, we could say that the joint uh, sea areas include both the maritime areas and the estuaries. We need to first think about the cooperation projects that involve the fishermen and the locals living in the neighborhood. And the communities should spearhead the ecological tourism projects. But when we compare this perspective to the authorities, I think we think differently. Although both governments of North and South uh, speak up for the necessity of joint fishing, but on the West Sea, they want they are after the aggregates and they want uh, some of the development gains and on the east sea they have more focus on logistics neither government is thinking of the benefits that will be given to the local communities through joint cooperation by peaceful uh, use of the uh, border areas, we have to put first the interest of the fishermen. That's what I wanted to say as a principle. Let's first look at the West Sea. The coastal areas are quite complicated. There are 130 plus islands. They're close to the mainland. And so this is used as a breeding uh, area for many of the seabirds. And there are estuaries. Uh, that uh, form the Han River, the Imjin River, and Yesong River. There are a lot of wetlands and sandbars, and the tidal differences are very high, and the coast lines are very complicated. By that, uh, we see that it's very difficult to plan or develop some projects. And this area needs protection. And between the DMC and NLL, there is the Han River, ecologically or environmentally. Uh, there are not areas that are uh, preserved. Kawan uh, DMZ is designated as the uh, reserve under the UNESCO that's on the east coast, but on the west side, uh, none of these areas are protected. And as for the Han River, there are plans to construct more bridges, including the NLL. The West Sea prioritizes development projects instead of uh, preservation. Uh, but uh, there is a plan to create a special zone for West Sea peaceful cooperation. And so there has been consensus built on both the, wet, uh, the north side and the south side. And a joint fishing is one of the projects. And uh, logistics will be limited. So as the first stepping stone, the fishing uh, activities are uh, allowed for uh, the both sides of the north and south partially and but uh, we need to have some protection activities uh, instead of opening up the joint fishing activities fully and uh, in 2009 KMI has provided 
provided the blueprint for joint use of maritime border areas. We see small circles, the ones that are circled green are areas that need uh, protection. And there are ecological parks, and there are transboundary bios biosphere reserves. And so these are the proposals and recommendations drawn up already in 2009. And other than protection measures, there are also ideas for developing uh, tourism attractions. So we have to have both, otherwise we cannot have ecological protection. And this is a lesson learned from the West Sea. In the last Pyeongchang Peace Forum, we learned a lot about the migratory birds. There were the white-naped cranes, swan geese, black-faced spoonbills, and spotted sea lions. Uh, these animals do require uh, protection. And as for the spotted sea lions, they are uh, outside the scope of our talk because obviously it's not a bird. But if you see on the map, including the West Sea, on even the East Sea, these sea lions uh, uh, inhabit in these areas. Looking at the number of the animal in the 1930s, there used to be 8,000, but in the 80s, it has reduced to 2,300, and in the 2000s, it's less than 1,000. And the number of the animal living on Baekneongdo Island, it is going down gradually. And so we can see that the spotted sea lion is near extin extinction. We need protection measures at the same time for developing tourism to protect the spotted sea lion. And seasonally, we see that the uh, number of animal increases in the summer. So this is the area where the sea lions uh, inhabit, and then they travel in the winter time for breeding. If you look at the map on the right-hand side, it goes from the South Sea, and then it travels up high as the Pyotr uh, Sea coast in Russia, and it goes through the Lasan wetland. It's one of the Ramsar wetlands in North Korea. It includes the Pipado Island, and there are uh, sea lions and seals that live here. There's the sea lion that spends its summers on the West Sea, and then it travels to the East Sea and northward in the winter season. And what North Korea says is uh, they refer to some of the documents to track the traces of the sea lions along the North Pacific. And so we see that the sea lions take a rest in uh, near the Korean Peninsula but uh, there is a difference of opinion in the migratory path of the sea lion between the South Korea and North Korean scholars, so we need joint research. And moving on to the East Sea, there is the uh, demarcation line, the military demarcation line, which is uh, drawn in white. and. Uh, when we uh, define the open seas, it is perpendicular to the land, but here it is drawn parallel to uh, latitude uh, 38.36, but uh, the NLL is drawn here and there are some deserted islands. And these are also habitats for migratory birds. Compared to the West Sea, the coastal lines in the East Sea is quite simple. 
In North Korea, the transboundary biosphere reserve has been designated, including the Kumgang Mountain and also the coastal lines that is uh, drawn in blue here. But uh, in South Korea, we have the Soraksan National Park. Uh, the land only is uh, in the reserve area. There's the Gangwon Research Institute, and they connected the coastal lines and proposed co-development or co-protection of the coastal lines by north and south. As uh, has been proposed, I believe this is in line with uh, the philosophy that I also respect, that we should protect first and develop tourism later. <laughs> and there is a disconnect, but we could go along the mountain ranges to connect the protection area between north and south. And if we could have a wider coverage of such protected land and coastal lines, I think this could be a good idea. But uh, looking at the Ministry of a maritime affairs plan drawn up in 2020, it's mostly about the use and development of developing the uh, sea farms and not much about protection. And there's uh, one mention of uh, preserving the areas near uh, Ulungdo Island. If the government proceeds in this direction, then the uh, maritime uh, ecology in the East Sea will be severely destroyed. The fishermen uh, in North and South have uh, worked uh, together and they can uh, engage in at, uh, joint fishing in this area. And there was a case in which uh, the uh, areas near Jodo were used jointly. And this could be a good opportunity to begin a discussion about not only joint fishing, but also ecotourism. And ecotourism does not limit itself to just the adjacent areas. It could also go up to north. Ecologically, North Korea uh, thinks uh, of these areas as important areas like the beaches and the ports, and they have some reserves. And they do have uh, ecological resources that they consider important, and so we could work with them to protect them and also utilize them as uh, tourism resources. Uh, there is the Kumia Migratory Bird Reserve, and near Tumen River, there is the Nasan Wetland under the uh, Ramsar Convention, and there is also the Kumgangsan Biosphere Reserve. As for Kumia Migratory Bird Reserve, it is home to many uh, migratory birds, and there are many seabirds that stop here, and this could be a very good site for watching birds. I guess my time is up. I will uh, hurry up. and. What is more important is, uh, I did talk about the Pipado Island. Uh, the seabird uh, reserve was designated near Nasan. 
and this uh, was shared with us. We have many uh, birds, including the pelagic cormorants, and uh, so many birds use this uh, island as a breeding island, and so the nickname Egg Island has come about. And as for, since we're talking about the seabirds in Korea, uh, seabirds uh, should be protected species. I would like to just show you some pictures of the birds. And these species are designated as birds to be protected. And this uh, shows a lot of possibilities and potentials for the inter-Korean cooperation. And there's the issue of bycatch of seabirds. Don't just uh, think of utilizing seabirds as resources for ecotourism, but there should be joint research done on the sacrifices of the seabirds by gillnet bycatch. And uh, we need to uh, urge the implementation of the Panmunjom Declaration so that the maritime areas can be used in a peaceful manner. The, it, the clause is there in the Panmunjom Declaration, so if we respect that, we can live up to our vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Han, and I'm a little sorry you, you rushed in the end through all your slides. They were very, very interesting, and I can tell you already from what I see here, there's a great interest in that, and a lot of, lot of questions came. So our last but not least presenter, Dr. Chi, please. Hello, I am Che Hyuna from Heinz Zeidel uh, Foundation Korea Office. Uh, Dr. Zelliger uh, has talked about uh, what are some of uh, he's talked about how ecotourism is just a small uh, step toward the direction of building peace. I'm just going to talk about what is possible. Uh, at the 8th Workers' uh, Party Congress, uh, they said that South Korea has to cooperate, otherwise future projects will not be possible. So uh, our conditions are uh, dependent on the direction North Korea will be taking. But what are the things that are feasible in Gangwon-do province. I'm going to talk about that. People think of uh, Kumgang Mountain and Sorak Mountain when they think of uh, Gangwon-do province. Uh, and they are designated as biosphere reserves. But we are going to fo focus on the birds and the habitats and how uh, strategically important and uh, valuable Gangwon-do region is. Uh, you may know about the foundation already, but to introduce the foundation to you very briefly, Hans Seidel Foundation is a political foundation of Germany and it is working under the motto of promoting peace, democracy, and development. I know I tend to hesitate every time I introduce this motto because it sounds so grandiose, but this is the true motto that we're working toward. It, uh, the Korea office was established in 1987 to share its unification experience and to support sustainable development on the Korean Peninsula. We are uh, engaged in many activities in the transboundary areas. And so we have to go together with the local residents for the successful ecotourism, and we have to give benefit to the local uh, residents, and we have to know what is in it for them. We are not a research-oriented uh, foundation. We uh, are focused on hands-on projects, and in North Korea, we work on awareness building, and in South Korea, 
we work on awareness building and also supporting decision making. From 2015, we have engaged in some uh, investigations, and we would like, and I would like to talk about how we can proceed from the investigation to ecotourism. We are uh, engaged in inland uh, investigation, and we also did investigation near the port areas. And the observed numbers, uh, the angles, we have looked at these metrics to estimate the number of birds. The red dots are where we conduct the investigations, the location. And every time we conduct an investigation, we set the conditions equally to get the accuracy up. But because we are doing this on the sea, we cannot guarantee uh, the accuracy every time. So uh, the fishermen in the local area is part of our team, and we also have a bird expert to conduct the investigation. We have fixed points and we uh, move around and we track the locations every 10 minutes to enhance the reliability of the investigation. Uh, this is the location of the investigation as of June 24, 2015. We use Google Earth and the GPS uh, satellites to get the location more precise and also the observed numbers correct. And we are able to investigate uh, 60,000 plus uh, birds of 36 species and if there are 20,000 plus uh, or 10,000 plus bird seabirds then we could designate the area as a special zone there were 64,000 seabirds investigated and this was a higher number. We had uh, Pacific loons and cormorants and murrelets and mergensers, and they were observed 10 kilometers away from their usual spots. And we have the harlequin ducks, brant geese, spectacled gillnotes, and yellow billed loons. In Kosang, we are able to spot. Uh, more of the harlequin ducks in the southern part than the northern part of Kosong. And not in the southern side. On the northern side, we conduct monitoring. And when we conduct monitoring, we uh, jo hold joint seminars and workshops for awareness building and capacity building of the North Koreans. People misunderstand that I go there physically in North Korea, but it's not the case. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Zelliger who is there himself uh, with the North Korean experts. I cannot share with you all the results of investigation, but during the period of monitoring, uh, in the time period of M March 2017, we uh, observed the pelagic cormorants near Hegumgang River. And so the birds were using uh, these areas as part of their migratory path. And as for the yellow-billed loon, we were able to spot them in both north and south, and the investigation was conducted in the same period, and we saw the same bird in both north and south, and uh, the harlequin duck is designated as an NT species, and we're able to see more of them in the south than in the north. 
If we did not have COVID-19 in Nasan, uh, Ramsar wetland, we're going to have a swan festival. We were able to spot a mute swan in November 2017, and it was the first time that it was spotted in North Koseong. Uh, we do tend to uh, repeat this in forums. Uh, flying birds know no boundaries. So by uh, being no boundary, uh, the birds can choose to inhabit any areas that they wish. Uh, people uh, between North Korea and South Korea cannot travel and visit each other freely. But we do need some uh, midway spots like the birds. Uh, so in order for that to be possible, we need to change the laws and regulations. But before that, there is the sanction issue. I want to cite one example. In October 2019, there was a festival held in Pyeonghannam-do province. It's one of the examples for bird watching events as part of ecotourism. To commemorate the World Migratory Bird Day, we ha hosted this event. The local residents were invited and children attending elementary schools were invited. It was uh, to discuss ways to uh, protect and use the wetlands, and we published uh, small booklets. Uh, we call uh, the bird swan goose, and we made some uh, merchandising, and this was used for awareness building. So there are many things that we need to watch out for. We should think about utilization and also preservation. As was mentioned by Mr. Uh, Jung Park, in 2015, North Korea began to pay more attention to ecological protection and they are interested in designating the wetlands uh, where the rare birds inhabit and they're mentioning the need for protection. Han Seidel uh, and EFP are engaged in capacity building projects in third world countries. And people mentioned that it's uh, difficult to uh, discuss cooperation in other areas, but uh, it seems that uh, the North Koreans are more interested and they're more open to attending relevant conferences and symposiums about wetland protection and environmental protection. And is the ecotourism really possible in North Korea? And people have doubts because of uh, sanctions. But tourism is not uh, in the scope of sanctions. But uh, if there is a large sum of cash involved, then it could go against the sanctions. For uh, tourism, the standard may be uh, inconsistent, but it does not involve large sums of cash. You only need uh, small sums of cash for meals and lodging. So I don't think this will go against the sanctions. And as for sanctions, preventing uh, North and South economic cooperation, uh, the nature of the tourism industry is uh, an intermediary in industry. And so this uh, is allowed under the North Korean sanctions. 
And uh, there's the Korean domestic sanction uh, that is the May 24th measure. And there was a mention of individual tourism that could be allowed. So uh, when we look at Kosong or uh, when we look at the Gangwon-do area or the East Sea or the West Sea, uh, these individual uh, ecotourism projects could be possible. I wanted to share with you one case study. Uh, the Young Pioneer Tours has a website introducing the Mundok Migratory Bird Reserve. And it says uh, in the Q&A, can I go bird watching in North Korea? And says, yes, it is entirely possible. Of course, you have to abide by certain rules. If, as a South Korean, you must be able to get a tourist visa from North Korea. And after getting a visa, you have to get approval for actually visiting North Korea. There are administrative processes that need to be cleared. In the, uni in the Unification Ministry and the South, Gover South Korean government, they are showing signs, uh, positive signs. So after COVID-19, I think it is possible to go to North Korea for ecotourism. But uh, lodging, log logistics, these should be paid for by the individual tourists. If the travel agencies are involved, then it could involve large sums of money and it could go against the sanctions. Uh, when we talk about the ecotourism based on bird watching, this may not be relevant to you, but we could understand the connectivity amongst the birds that do travel, and we could use the nature as it is, and we could have the people observe the birds, and I think uh, there is a possibility uh, that can come from Gangwon province, and we could also provide benefits to the local residents with the right program. For ecotourism to be viable, we need to have good monitoring system in place. There are certain monitoring groups and experts and researchers who are involved, and I think there are areas that could be improved. I know we don't have the time to talk about this, but we could find the solutions for better and consistent monitoring. With that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very birdy and uh, interesting. And it also provoked a lot of comments. We have now here really a long list of uh, more than 15 comments, uh, and I'm very glad for that, and questions. and. Um, well, I cannot promise we uh, come to all of them, but maybe I start now to ask uh, every one of our presenters one or two representative, quest representative questions, and then we see how much time we have for more. So I would start again with, with uh, Mr. Watkins. You um, start with the first comment saying bird watching and ecotourism is really a good idea, it said, which is nice to say. But uh, if we talk, uh, uh, that's now the question there about ecotourism. Does it really prom holds what it promises for North Korea? If you think we go there and say, let's do ecotourism to pre pre preserve the area, but then in reality, there are three people coming, eight people coming. They will not build their economy on these very small groups. Is, do you see really a viable way for that? And I want to ask you another question, which was twice posed here. If you promote bird tourism uh, or bird watching tourism, and if you consequently uh, protect migratory birds, how about avian influenza? That seems to be a problem here. Uh, I think you can just answer, and then I go with the next question to the next person, OK? So, uh, firstly, about uh, viability. I think that um, that e the ecotourism product uh, needs to be broader than just uh, just birds. Um, 
it's it's a way of uh, of introducing uh, people to North Korea and building greater understanding about um, about the country. And I think well designed, it can uh, bring benefits to those local communities as well. Um, it uh, yes, it won't change the world, um, but it, but it is part of um, part of people learning about uh, about the country. Um, the second question was about uh, avian influenza. Um, we really have uh, only very small. Uh, incidences of uh, of bird flu being uh, being caught by by people um, normally involved in in, uh, in the poultry uh, production um, is in the few cases that it has occurred um, and uh, the people are, are and also um, uh, they sh they're it, it can easily be planned to ensure that there is no um, no movement of uh, uh, movement from uh, wetlands to um, production um, facilities uh, by by using by by the way you plan and the way you uh, deal with uh, uh, with with hygiene. So I, I don't see that um, at all being a problem. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Park, I want to ask you also two questions. You came here, but your field of uh, uh, interest is mainly the West Coast, really, and you are a specialist there. And actually, somebody commented uh, that uh, he was aware of West Coast migratory birds uh, quite more, and it was more reported, but much less on the East Coast. So do you see, we are very happy you are here now at the East Coast in our Kangwon province here, but do you see there's the same possibility to create interest? Let's say if you think of the tidal flats you have in the west coast and all these, yeah, Toyose or so st staying there, but in the east coast it's maybe more difficult it's simply because the birds are far out of the uh, sea, in, on the sea or so, and some, other, some birds like cranes are not here. And the second thing, uh, it was a question which came a little later. Uh, there's a lot being said about marine pollution and waste. Uh, how would the marine waste problem influence the possibility of um, ecotourism and what could the government do against it? Yes, uh, to answer your first question, the ecologists are interested in the migratory species, especially the transboundary migratory birds. It's difficult to find the uh, researchers uh, in the NLL areas, in the DMZ areas. There are species that can be cited from the South Korean side, and if the if there is a joint research done, then we could cite more species for the bird seas they are further out. And so if there is a, a partner uh, in North Korea, if we could uh, engage in co-research, then we could gather more data and it would be beneficial to uh, increasing the body of research. There was an attempt in West Sea. There is an island called Yudo, and the spoon uh, bills uh, when uh, so we were able to uh, work with the North Korean scholars and also there was partners from the Joseon University from Japan and we were able to initiate the joint research, but we had to stop in the midway. So I think we need to have a joint research network involving North and South Korea. And within the reserves, uh, we could use the satellites for monitoring purposes. And if the South Korean scholars could participate, we could use the equipment 
and then I think we could accumulate more uh, data jointly. And I don't think we'll be breaking any rules or sanctions. So as for now, research on the East Sea, the Korean uh, scholars were not able to embark on the research uh, fully. And I think the North Korean scholars are only approaching their research on a limited basis. And to answer your second question, as for the maritime waste, of course, we could directly engage in projects to reduce the maritime waste. But on the East Sea, we don't have the data of how much maritime waste is created and how much is uh, moved, the source. And we don't know the type. It's not just the species that migrate, the maritime waste also migrates. It could come from Russia, North Korea, and Japan, and they could invade the coastal lines, and it could uh, invade the birds' habitats. We need to have the data accumulated and do the analysis together. We need cooperation from the partners. ICC has conducted uh, maritime waste cleanup events, and I think we are uh, building the databases, but we have the blank because North Korea is not participating, and we see some of the pieces of the puzzles missing. So we need to have networking among the researchers and investigators. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh um, <clears throat> Han, I would like, uh, Mr. Park, I, I would like to ask you uh, two questions also. There was a, a comment and a question regarding the question what uh, would be the government involvement in this. One comment saying it depends really on the policies of the government, and the other was more like a question does peace ecotourism also need government permission? Now, you work for a governmental office, and you are also moonlighting. You came from the West Coast up here. Thank you very much. What do you see? What would be preconditions? Let's say, Kangwon government should create the central government should create, and then maybe North and South could create together for making this come come true. And the other question, and uh, um, I want to poke you there a little bit. There, there was a question on uh, or, or a comment saying for the Sora Kumgang San DMZ area, we should rather focus not on development but first on preservation. And you also spoke of the question: When is social overhead capital really productive? Uh, will it be only new roads? We personally, because we work in, in Kosong, we, we sometimes suffer a lot because whenever you come, there's a new road built, obviously. The Koreans are great road builders, but what else can they do with the money? Should they directly support fishermen or farmers? What should they do with the money? What would be productive, in your opinion? The, uh Yes, uh, very interesting and important points that were raised. Uh, regarding the first point, uh, government participation, uh, well, I hail from Jeollabukdo, and I work with the Jeollabukdo government, and policy is very important. Uh, Designing the policy is crucial, but what, what is important is that uh, you have to make sure that the policies are realistic, because sometimes if you look at the mechanism of how policies are draw, drawn out, you can see that they are sometimes quite thoughtless. I think under the Moon administration, there are various ways of collecting opinions. Uh, they have worked very hard to make sure that various uh, views are collected through diverse means. Uh, I am also a member um, of the uh, counseling, providing counseling for the Ministry of Maritime Affairs. and. 
I can see the com comparison of how the current government is trying to work towards the opinion gathering. But because uh, ecotourism is a very holistic uh, realm, we have to not only think of birds, for instance, but all kinds of wildlife. And also because it's tourism, we have to think about infrastructure. And uh, so we need experts on all fronts. And the same goes for for Tarlado. If we take a particular site, we have diverse views as to how to use that particular area. There are people who are very conservative as to uh, uh, whereas there are some people who are very liberal. Some people say we should not even go there, whereas other people say that we should make sure that there is lots of activity in this particular location and that we need to make it uh, more accessible so that people can move around there uh, freely. So there are, they, there are very realistic opinions and also uh, very conservative ones as well. And while the central government will try to be consistent with their policies, I'm sure that they have their share of troubles as well. Uh, working with the Tolabukto government, uh, I think that Gangwon-do would be in a similar situation because I think that you would have to pay heed to what the central government does, but I also believe that you need to have your own roadmap, regardless of what the central government is doing. You need to have your province's strategy. For instance, you could have also strategies or roadmaps for uh, the private sector your foundation or the EAFP uh, and your international coalitions could also be a part of that. Uh, if you have that kind of an international collaboration, for instance, that could be a uh, very important means for you to change the government policies as well. So that is one thing I wanted to point out. Uh, moving on to the second point, I think we need to take into consideration uh, the reality. We, both with uh, Dr. Che and you, we went to Semangum, um, and we, when we do these surveys, there are lots of areas that are really poor in accessibility, whereas we sometimes go to do surveys that have great SOC. So I really don't know how to be tactful uh, when we when I talk about SOCs, but that that is why I think UNESCO has divided the locations into three parts. And when I when we think of SOCs, I don't think that we need uh, social overhead capital in the core locations, for instance. But I think that we need to put thought into how far you want to go. Of course, you need uh, good roads, but how far are you going to expand that? Now, if we are going to be productive, I think it's difficult to assess. Of course, if you have SOCs in place, then in the short run, it would be very productive, because then in the short run, you will have um, good turnaround. And so it would make sense to make huge investments. But if you look in the long term, I think that the answer will be difficult, for, because, different, because uh, Korea has made very compact growth during the past few decades, but we did that uh, at the expense of our environment. We had to make some uh, sacrifices. That is not to say that we should do away with uh, pro productivity or economic growth, but if you look at it from a long-term perspective, natural capital and protecting that natural capital could have a lot more added value than having 
uh, industrial complex or a plant, for instance. I think that the times that we live in are different from the industrial era when it made sense to have lots of uh, factories. Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, Dr. Tse, uh, I, there were several questions on, one was, I think, more clarification question uh, on the uh, bird festival in Moondog, uh, where Germans could go. Uh, the question was, can Koreans also go to such a place? And then there were questions, two questions, actually, what would be the next steps to do? And uh, one on uh, question also recently came up here, if you want eco-peace tourism, understood as an area for eco-peace tourism, it's a large area. Would it be even feasible to to define and then also to designate such an area? Yes, as for the first question, as for the uh, Mundog Bird Festival, it would be difficult for the South Koreans to visit. I'm a South Korean national, and I would have to go through many procedures and if I were to go into North Korea, I would have to get an invitation letter from North Korea. And based on that, I will have to get approval from South Korea and then go back to North Korea to get a visa. When Dr. Zelliger was introducing me, he mentioned that in 2019, I visited North Korea. The uh, foundation has been in Korea for 30 years, and it was the first time in 30 years that a Korean national was able to visit North Korea. But if you are an individual tourist, you could uh, go through a Chinese travel agency and the North Korean officials are more lenient in issuing uh, tourist visas. At Pyeongchang Peace Forum, we are talking about many things, including peace, including inter-Korean relations, and also about Gangwon province. And we're dealing with a very special topic of birds and ecotourism. There has been consistent talk about the topic. This should not be a one-time event. We should continue to have this dialogue going forward. I know there are new things that you learned and the, some things that you already knew, and they have been reinforced and updated during the presentations. Ecotourism, environmental protection in North Korea, what they're doing to fight climate change. Many people are having doubts about what North Korea is doing because people would tend to think that North Korea is suffering from food shortage and they cannot afford to think about protecting the environment. And uh, people think about uh, North Korea caring more about the agricultural production and facilities. Yes, North Korea is still uh, heavily dependent on agriculture, but it is also interested in how they can enhance productivity while preserving the environment. And uh, yes, there are reclamation projects and development projects, SOC projects in North Korea. And as was mentioned by Mr. Park, there are areas that Gangwon-do and uh, North Korea can cooperate in terms of more development. We are not saying that we should put an end to all the development projects. Uh, we are not saying that. We need to be able to maintain the ecological value, and we have to use the uh, natural habitat wisely. And the next step uh, is to continue to have this dialogue. And if possible, uh, we could invite a third world country experts. And I know that uh, the Dr. Zelliger is going to play a bridging role. And what is the most suitable area for ecotourism? 
uh, as for site selection, uh, there are many biosphere reserves designated and uh, we should not designate more areas for reserves. I think we need to just work on the reserve areas that we already have. Birds know no boundaries. Likewise, we should be able to utilize the reserves. We have many uh, bird watchers who want to protect the nature and they want to enjoy the nature as is instead of trying to artificially designate special areas. So I think we need to be mindful of the protection of the Thank environment. Very much. And now we Thank come you. to an end. I really had hoped I could ask you to give some very specific last recommendation to Kangwon province. But if I would do that, I think the, our organizers here would get angry because we are already over time. I want to thank everybody who is here. All this experience on the, um, on the panel we have. We had people who really worked for many decades on these issues. But we see also, we still have a lack of data. Amazingly, if you think that some people work so long on it, but it's so difficult to get data. We still have a lot to do for awareness raising. If you think of AI, for example, and many other things, and that people simply are not aware also about the treasures of birds they have here in Kangwon province. And I enjoyed it very much, also the discussion on social overhead, capital, we couldn't really solve all the problems, but we hope with this session we could give you a glimpse into what would be possible if we focus on this as one potential area of cooperation of North and South. And now my greetings go again to everybody here in the room, uh, online, and hopefully also to the North Korean who one day will maybe see that on YouTube. Let's work together. These Birds are an incredible treasure of this country and of the world, and let's try to protect them together. Many thanks also to our translators who really had a hard time to translate uh, the yellow-billed loon or other, other words like that. That's not easy. I know that. Thank you very much. And with this, we conclude the session. Kamsamnida.